And I'll begin in verse 57, join me in verse 58. We'll follow that pattern down to verse 62. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home in my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for all we've seen and heard already. Thank you, Lord, for the, the fellowship. It sure was sweet. The singing, Lord, it sure, Lord, just uh, it, it brought us to the heights of heaven today. Thank you, Lord, for the songs we've sung. And Lord, thank you, Lord, for now the scripture open before us. And I pray that, Lord, you would uh, you'd meet with us in a very special way today. We, we need you. We need to hear from heaven. I pray that you give us ears to hear. I pray that our hearts would be soft and ready to receive your word into good ground. I pray that, Lord, we'd have lives that are yielded and and Lord, surrender to you so we can put it into practice. And Father, as has been prayed already, Lord, if there's anybody here that does not yet know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation when they come and place their faith, place their all in Jesus Christ for salvation. Help me, Lord. I pray that you'd have my thoughts. I pray that, Lord, you'd loosen my lips. And Lord, just use me, uh, Lord, to bring honor and glory to your name. And, and Lord, help me to be a blessing to your dear people. We love you. And it is in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. And you may be seated. As I begin to preach this message today, I want to make something very, very clear this morning. I'm not preaching a salvation by works. I'm going to be talking about fellowship today. I'm not talking about faith today as far as salvation. We understand in the Bible clearly and very plainly teaches us that salvation is by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation's a gift. It's not something I can earn. I don't earn my gifts. I, uh, uh, when I get a birthday present, I don't earn that. Somebody doesn't hand me a birthday present and then hand me a receipt and say, now pay me. That, that, that kind of destroys the idea of a gift, a gift is something that somebody else has purchased and gives to us. Well, salvation is a gift. God paid for that gift. How did he do that? He gave us his son. The Bible says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? So God has already given us his son. On the Lord Jesus Christ. So salvation is a gift. Jesus Christ has paid for that. How did he pay for that? With his shed blood, the sufferings on the cross, he was crucified, died, and was buried and raised again from the dead. That's the gospel. That's where salvation's at. Salvation is not in me coming to church X number of times to earn heaven. It's not me putting enough money in a plate to, to purchase heaven. It's not me doing enough religious deeds or a, a particular variation of religious deeds that's going to win me favor with God. Salvation is plainly put this way. As a sinner, I realize and I come to the conclusion that I cannot save myself. There's nothing that I can do. I cannot be good enough. I cannot be religious enough. I cannot change enough. I, I cannot do anything to save myself. I am utterly helpless when it comes to salvation. And the only thing I can do is call out to God for mercy and grace and believe on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I was talking to uh, uh, some, some folks the other day and uh, I was actually talking to a gentleman. I, I remember exactly where I was at. And uh, I, I was talking about this very thing, about salvation being by grace uh, and not by works. And I said, you know, I said, if there's only one man in heaven, I know who that man is. And that was the thief on the cross beside Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ was crucified, and there was two thieves being crucified on either side of him. The one thief just kept uh, uh, running Jesus Christ down. You know, if you're Christ, save yourself and save us. He, was, he wasn't interested in Jesus being Christ. He just wanted to get off the cross. He was looking for a way off there. And the other thief, he was paying attention to things going on. And as he heard Jesus Christ speak from the cross and watched how Jesus Christ conducted himself on the cross, he told the other thief to kind of shut up. He said, we're, we're here because we belong here. But this man's done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me when thou enterest in thy kingdom. And what did Jesus Christ promise that man? He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. If there's only one man walking the streets of gold today, it's that man. Why? Because Jesus Christ promised that one man that he'd be in paradise. He'd be in heaven when the day was over. Amen. Now, how did that man get to heaven? Did he go to church? He couldn't. He was nailed to a cross. Did he get baptized? He couldn't. He was nailed to a cross. Did he put money in an offering plate? Did he, did, he, did he do any religious deed? He could not do anything. He was nailed to the cross. He was completely helpless. Helpless. And there we see the picture of God's grace at its brightest because he could do nothing but simply believe on Jesus Christ. We say, Pastor Ross, it can't be that simple. My friend, it is that simple. 
We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 10, 13 that Brother Dan read. Uh, uh, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say call and do good deeds. It doesn't say call and, 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 and martyr yourself. It doesn't say call and, 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 and do anything, but it says call upon the Lord. That's with faith. That's believing in our heart, and that's faith. We need to understand that because if we don't, then we're going to get some mixed up ideas when I go forward from here. So salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. God's grace, God's undeserved favor placed upon us and our faith, what we believe. Amen. What is faith? Forsaking all, I trust him. Amen. I simply realize I can't trust myself. I, 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 the only one I can trust that can save me is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. John 3, 16, so powerful, is it not? For God so loved the world that he gave. There's grace, amen, he gave. He loved us, why did he love us? It doesn't tell us why he loved us, he just did. That's grace, amen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, there's the gift, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, there's the faith, believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Two types of religion in the world today. Religion's based on works, You've got to do this. You've got to be here. You've got to be a member this way or that way. Uh, You've got to satisfy all these requirements that religion set forth. And there's uh, the religion that that is based upon the grace of God and the mercy of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the only two in the world today. One that sets up on works and one that's based on grace. Amen. And we believe like the Bible teaches that our salvation is based on the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Believing on Jesus Christ, salvation costs me nothing. And please understand that statement as I go forward from here. Believing on Jesus Christ costs me nothing. But I'm not talking about believing on Jesus Christ and salvation today. I'm talking about following Jesus Christ. Believing costs me nothing. It costs Christ everything. But to follow him, there's a cost associated with followership. And I want to understand this today because I'll tell you what, I think we've gotten away from that. I think we've stopped taking our relationship with God and following Jesus Christ as seriously as we should. And we've, we've got today a very throwaway, a very uh, uh, shallow uh, understanding of what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our text today teaches away from that. Our Savior's words teach us that it is going to cost something to follow him. It doesn't cost anything to believe on him. It does not cost anything to be saved. Please understand that. And I'll repeat that. I don't want anybody walking there and say, well, I can't be saved because I can't do this or I can't do that. I'm not talking about salvation primarily today, although I have just talked about it right there. I'm talking about following the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a message for believers, amen? And I'm asking you a question. Are you willing to be a follower of the king? Are you willing to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because i tell you what, we're lacking followers today. We've got plenty of believers but I want to be a follower. I want to be a disciple, not merely uh, just one that believes on him. Like I talked about the elections, if we're not going to get out of our homes and go and do something that can affect change, we, we're, not part of the, we're not part of the solution. What this, world needs, and, 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 uh, what this world needs more is more followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. More people to leave the church house with a message of Jesus Christ and take that message to our homes and take that message to our schools and take that message to our workplaces and take that message into our neighborhoods and take that message around the world. It's not just for the missionaries, my friends. It's for you and for me. We'll be examining these missionaries that come in this week and saying and admiring them. Why? Because God's called them to go and God's called them to serve in a wonderful way. But that call didn't come until they were following him first. I thank God for those, and I admire missionaries. Why? Because they've got a wonderful call of God upon their life. But we can all be followers. Let me just take us through here this morning. I'm going to be very simple this morning and very, very plain this morning. I, I want us to understand this because I want you to make a good choice. And I, and I said Sunday night, I was talking about the heights of, uh, of following the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it, there is some effort involved in this. But I'll tell you what, serving God is the best thing you ever do with your life. Serving him is the highest calling you ever, you ever undertake. And I, I want to put it out there for us today. First of all, look at verse 57 and 58. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee with this over the ghost. Lord, boy, I like what you're saying. I like what you're doing. I, I've seen the miracles. I, I, I see the way people respond. I, I, the energy in the crowd is awesome. I want to follow you. And there were people like that in Jesus' day. He was a very, Jesus Christ was the, was the best preacher that's ever walked on the face of the earth. The greatest sermon ever preached was the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, he was a phenomenal preacher. He did not preach uh, 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 in a way that, that turned people away like the Pharisees and the Sadducees did, like a hypocrite. But he preached with power. He preached with love. I mean, when Jesus Christ asked the disciples, whom say men that I am, uh, they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some say Elijah. Now, let me just say this. John the Baptist, boy, I'll tell you what, he was a leather-lunged, uh, leather-wearing, uh, locust eaten a machine when he preached amen and people heard 
heard him and had to make a choice whether they were going for God or against God. There was, when, you, when you heard John the Baptist preach, you knew what side of the fence you were on, amen? And the common people, they heard him and they got baptized. And I'll tell you what, Miss Susie, they, they, were, but they, they were locked in, amen? But the Pharisees and Sadducees were back and said, well, he hasn't gone to our schools. He doesn't talk real polished like and then they turned away from him, and there was a great divide there. So he was a powerful preacher. How about Elijah? Think about the courage of a man uh, like Elijah. He, he, got the, hey, he got the attention of the king, wicked King Ahab, and his devilish wife Jezebel, amen. And he said, you, you, and, and when they met, uh, Ahab said, you're the one that's troubling Israel. And, 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 and Elijah looked back at the king and said, it's not me that's troubling Israel. It's you and your wicked wife. And he called him out, amen. And, and, and the pulpit ought to be allowed to preach to the politicians. The pulpit ought to be allowed, and, and again, I could care less about tax-exempt status and everything like that. That's a bunch of hooey designed to keep the influence of the people of God out of, out of society, but I, I could care less about that, amen? If a politician's crooked, he's crooked, amen? So Elijah pointed out uh, and said, you're the problem with Israel, you're troubling Israel. And he said, I'll tell you what, you get all the prophets, you get some prophets bail together, and the prophets of the grove, the ones that sit at Jezebel's table, about 850 prophets together, and he said, we're going to have a little contest. We're going, to get, we're going to erect an altar. You go ahead and erect your altar to Baal, who you call upon all the time, who's troubling Israel. You go ahead and erect an altar to Baal, and uh, we'll have two calves here. We'll cut them up in pieces, put them on there, and we'll do a sacrifice. And he said, the God that answers by fire, let him be the God of Israel. And so the prophets of Baal got their altar together. They killed, the, they killed the cow, put it on there. And the Bible says they began to call upon Baal from the early morning. And they called upon Baal, oh, Baal, hear us. And they kept up with their chants, oh, Baal, hear us, oh, Baal, hear us. And nothing happened. One hour passes, two hour passes. It keeps going on longer. And Elijah starts to have a little fun with them. Hey, maybe your God's on a journey, amen? Maybe he's out to lunch. Maybe, uh, maybe he's just sleeping right now and he can't hear you. Maybe you need to cry a little louder. And they begin to cry louder. They, they got so desperate they began to cut themselves uh, uh, with knives and things like that, hoping that the... Uh, the, the pouring out of their blood and the, and, and the uh, damage they were doing to themselves would, would, would cause him to pay attention. But you know what? Ba Baal is not a god. He's an idol, the work of men's hands. There's only one God, and he's Jehovah. He's the one we find in the Bible, the Lord God, amen. And uh, uh, so they didn't get any answers. They began to throw themselves on, consume us with a sacrifice. They were offering themselves to be martyrs to their God, and, and nothing happened. And finally, after they wasted enough time and most of the day, uh, Elijah went to them. And I know I'm, I'm giving you the Ross Revised version of this whole thing. Amen. But, uh, but Elijah just said to them, step aside, boys. You've had your time. You've had more than enough time to get out of here. Yeah, obviously, he's not listening. He said, stand aside. So he began to repair the altar of the Lord and put the rocks back in place. Amen. And after he got the rocks back in place and got the wood under there, he said, uh, I'm missing something here. Uh, I need some water. Are you thirsty, Elijah? No, I just want you to start pouring water on the sacrifice and on the wood. Amen? And they got 12 barrels of water. I think one for each of the houses of Israel. Amen? One for each of the tribes. So they, there was a symbol, symbolism there. And began to pour water on the sacrifice and water on the wood. Now, I'm no Boy Scout. Don't claim to be one. Didn't even sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I can't really speak on that. But the way to start a fire is not, uh, way to start a fire is not with a bunch of water. But they poured those 12 barrels of water on the sacrifice, on the wood, and it even, even a little trench around that altar there was filled up with water. So it was completely soaking. And, uh, and then Elijah just stepped back and he prayed a prayer. And boy, I tell you what, God heard his prayer and God answered. That fire came down out of heaven. The people stepped back. Elijah was praying. That fire came down. That fire consumed that sacrifice. It was gone. Consumed the wood. It was gone. Consumed the water. It was gone. And it was so hot it consumed the stones. I mean, boom, it was gone. Amen. And the people fell down on their faces. The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. That's who they compared to Jesus Christ to. Elijah, one that had that, 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 that boldness to stand up in front of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and call them vipers and, and hypocrites and, and, and took a stand against them and said they were leading people astray. Jesus Christ was not some sissy. He was not some uh, effeminate, uh, uh, lisping, stammering uh, 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 wallflower. He was a man, a man like John the Baptist, like Elijah. And, and Jesus Christ, uh, 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 you know, he was the one that captured this man's attention in verse number 57. He said, I want to follow you. People want to follow strong men. They want to follow a strong leader. And all down through history, you can see that, 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 that it's inherent in man. Well, Jesus Christ, again, uh, uh, he, he, he was uh, very compelling to this man. He said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus looked at him and said to him in verse number 58, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus Christ answered this man and his desire to follow him by, by mentioning to him, by, by, by making him aware that there, there's a sacrifice in following he said, if you want to follow me, guess what? You won't be following me into houses of, uh, of ease. You won't be following me into palaces. I don't even have a place to lay my head, and you want to follow me. There, there's a sacrifice in serving God and following God. What is that sacrifice? It's a sacrifice of time. 
These folks that say they're Christians but never darken the doorway to church, I, I, I call that into question. I don't think they're following. They might be believing, but I don't think they're following. Well, Pastor Ross, there's no command in the Bible you need to go to church. Most certainly there is. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. The Bible says we're supposed to gather ourselves together more and more as we see the day approaching. I don't know, I don't know about you, but if you're not paying attention to the signs of the times and you can't see the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know what world you're looking at, amen? I was looking over some reports this week and, and, and some news stories. Uh, they're watching this uh, volcano, underground volcano out in, out in the west, amen? If that thing blows, that would be, that would be like a 100 megaton bomb going off out in the west. I mean, it would just throw enough ash into the, into, into the uh, atmosphere and, and decimate a large portion of our country. And we're talking about natural disasters. We're talking about military things going on with North Korea and our subs moved off the coast of uh, North Korea and our, our nuclear bombers just flew some uh, 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 missions over that way. I mean, militarily, it's a, a very challenging time, a very frightening time. Uh, naturally, uh, uh, the, 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 the shortages of food and the, and the famines and, and, and things like that. I mean, there, there's a lot going on in this world. I had a sermon together, but I haven't preached it yet, but uh, the signs of the times and Jesus Christ gave us way marks to judge regarding his coming. And I'll be honest with you, as I will look down that, that checklist, almost every one of them is, tick, is ticked off uh, unmistakably. He says, you know, uh, uh, Jesus Christ said uh, uh, to follow me. Guess what? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't even have any place in my head. There's a sacrifice, a sacrifice in time, uh, the sacrifice in, in finances. We, we are to give. I, I know there are charlatans on TV that, uh, that, that run that and run that in a, in a, in a perverted direction. But that, that's not the case. As Christians, we know the tithe is the Lord's. We, we, ought to be, we ought to be invested and involved in missions giving. Why? Because that's our, that's our command. That's our commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We partner with those that are willing to go, so we give to missions. This is our church home, amen. We ought to be giving for the maintenance and the upkeep of the, uh, of the church. Thank you. Okay, I got three there, so I'm a little happier. Um, uh, but again, if we're members of the church, guess what? This is the, what this place looks like and how we upkeep this place. And what we do is dependent upon our giving here. We gotta, there, there's a sacrifice there. I can't go out and buy everything I want. Why? Because some of my, some of my finances are spoken for. The tithe, my missions giving, uh, my giving to the church, uh, my being a blessing to other people. There's a sacrifice in that, a sacrifice of time, a sacrifice of finances. Can I say there's a sacrifice of, uh, of talents as well? I appreciate our orchestra. I wish uh, when the orchestra struck up, everybody come in and listen to how wonderfully they do. They're, they're beautiful. Uh, th 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 their talents are using those for God. Our choir, their beautiful voices blending together. How great thou art. What a wonderful song. Uh, the talents. If God's given you a talent, uh, are you using it for him? A follower says, you know what? God's given me this talent. I want to find some way to glorify God with it. What can I do? How can I use this talent for God? So it's a sacrifice. I'm not just going to consume it upon myself, but I'm going to find some outlet so I can glorify God with it and use it to, to bring honor and glory to his name. There's a sacrifice invested. He said, hey, if you want to follow me, guess what? It's a sacrifice. There's a sacrifice to follow me. Uh, and, and again, you can look at that sacrifice in a many different variations. I just hit on a couple of them this morning. But not all of the sacrifice in following. And, and let me just say it this way and, and just give you a couple of scriptures to kind of tie this all together. And when uh, Jesus Christ met uh, uh, Matthew, his name was Levi in the book of Luke, in Luke 5, 27, the Bible says, After these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And the Bible says Levi left all, rose up and followed him. There was a sacrifice. Levi had to leave it behind to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. How about, what, how about Peter's question in Mark 10, 28? Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Peter said, we, We've left all to follow you. He understood the sacrifice. We've left home. We've left our jobs. We've left our family. We've left our friends to follow you. Uh, what's it profiting us right now? And, and Jesus said, Nobody that, that has left these things is going to be lacking in this world or even in the world to come. I'll tell you what, uh, uh, what, what I've been called to sacrifice down here, God has abundantly repaid. If I've had to leave a friend on the outside, guess what? God has given me friends on the inside. If, I've had to, if some family have stayed on the outside, God has given me a family on the inside. I mean, God has repaid abundantly, amen? I am much, much richer for being a follower of Jesus Christ than I ever was just doing my own thing and going my own way and following my own agenda. I've got a, I've got a family that genuinely loves me, and, and Brother Norm was giving testimony in Sunday school today about a blessing. He just was thanking God he got to come to a church where the truth is preached and where people are nice to him. 
we weren't so nice to him in Sunday school, but uh, I appreciate him saying so, amen? But, but again, that, that's, what, that's what the church is all about. This week, I went back and watched a video that, uh, um, that was put together for our 25th anniversary last year, and boy, the comments just kept coming out, family and, and the friendship and the, and the community here, and, and boy, that, that, that has been the, the bedrock of Heritage Baptist Church. It is a family. It has been a family since its start, and it will continue to be a family as long as we're following Christ together. We've not, lost any, we've not lost anything in following him. We've had to sacrifice some things, but God has wonderfully repaid those things. You know what? People say, well, I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to tithe. Well, I can't afford to give the missions. You can't afford not to give the missions. Well, I'll tell you what, when you, when you give the missions, it's wonderful how God just brings those blessings back in and keeps it going. If we just see ourselves as a conduit, we wouldn't worry about, we wouldn't worry about what's coming in uh, because, or what's going out because we know God's going to keep bringing it in. God will supply all your, all, all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God's good, amen? So we see the sacrifice in following. But we go down to verse number 60. Look at these words. Um, uh, in verse number 59, I'm sorry. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Boy, at first that seems pretty harsh. I want to follow you, but I need to go bury my dad. Uh, no, let the dead bury their dead. Go, go and preach the gospel. Well, who would be so heartless as to, as to forbid somebody from attending to a, a, a very close uh, a human need? But uh, let me put it in these contexts. Jesus is saying this. He said, let the world attend to its own duties. To preach the kingdom rises above every other duty. The disciple was probably an apostle who wished to stay with his father until his father's death and, and was putting things on hold until he cared for that. When we call to follow, guess what? It doesn't mean we leave, we leave family uh, obligations undone, but it doesn't mean we keep them in, our proper, in proper perspective. It doesn't mean we abuse our families or neglect our families, but it does mean we do take care of the things of God. When God asked, uh, uh, when, when Jesus Christ was asked what the great command of all the law was, what was it? To love the Lord our God with what? All of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. God wants to be number one. And that's what Jesus Christ is illustrating here. So he's, he, he's, he's illustrating the sacredness in following. It is an awesome thing to follow him. It, is a, it ought to be a sacred thing. It ought to be something we look at and cherish and say, you know what? I, I regard this as, 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 as the most special aspect of my life. I'm a child of God. Brother Norm, you, you manage a Walmart, but, but that's not your sacred call. Your sacred call is to follow Christ. Yes, God has given you a temporal employment as a manager at Walmart. I should, I'm sorry, I should have crossed myself. Um, but again, your highest calling is, is that of a, a follower of God. Joe, God's giving you the, the, the privilege to own a business and an and, and, and automotive repair, uh, and you put oil into wayward preacher's uh, 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 oil pans, amen, when they forget to put that in there. Uh, but, but again, your high calling is a follower of Jesus Christ. That, that's, the, that's the aspect of life that we miss sometimes. Brother Matt, you, you run a, a quality assurance uh, for the production lines uh, at, at your place of employment, but your high call is a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and, and if anybody, Brother Matt, I, I appreciates that. Brother Matt, uh, I tell you what, you follow him around, you get dizzy and tired all at the same time, amen? Two full-time jobs, and he's uh, preaching in the prisons with me and over at, the, uh, over at the manor teaching Bible studies and just giving himself to the Lord and, 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 and all his callings. It's a wonderful thing to see. So the, the sacredness of that calling to follow him, everything else pales in comparison. Everything else has to take a, a secondary nature to that. I think sometimes we're afraid of putting God first. We're afraid to say, okay, I'm going to let God have my best. We, we try to get by with giving God our leftovers. We try to get by with just giving God whatever remains. And then God says, no, I want, the, I, want the, I want the first. I want the best. So we, we serve God and, and realize there's a sacredness in following him. The Bible tells us, and, and, and the advice that Jesus Christ gave to this man, he said, uh, go thou and preach the kingdom of God. We understand the importance of representing God and telling others about God is the most important thing we can do. There's nothing that you and I will do this week that will affect eternity like telling some other soul about the Lord Jesus Christ. We affect eternity every time we attempt. And again, you don't have to be a pastor to be a preacher. All you have to do is go out and proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead and offers us salvation when we, when we trust him. Amen? And when we attempt to do that, whether that's handing out a, a gospel tract, whether that's telling with our lips, uh, whether it's just uh, inviting them to come hear the message so they can receive that, that is a wonderful and sacred opportunity that God's given to all of us. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. In 1 Corinthians 1.21, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 
Amen? Go and preach the gospel. Go and take this sacred call. As you, if you want to follow me, your sacred call will be to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That has been committed to everyone in this room. If we name Jesus Christ our Savior, we need to realize that to follow him is a sacred, there's a sacredness to it. And take that seriously and take that to heart. But as we go on a little bit further today, and let me finish off the sermon here uh, uh, with this last point this morning. Uh, the Bible says, uh, and the third uh, man that he spoke to in this passage here, in verse number 61, and another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What is he talking about here? There ought to be a steadiness in following. There ought not to be a desire in turning back from following the Lord. Once we start following the Lord, there ought not to be looking over our shoulder, comparing the old life to the new life, amen, in an unfavorable way. Uh, let me just say it this way. Um, people that have turned back in the Bible have caused problems for themselves and others. In Acts chapter 15, verse 37, and Barnabas uh, determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take with him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. What happened there? In um, uh, in Acts, uh, Paul and, and, and Barnabas are getting ready to go out on another missionary journey. Barnabas wants to take Mark. Mark had ditched them. Mark had bailed on them. Mark had turned away from following them earlier. And Paul said, no, he already turned back. Uh, we need somebody that's dependable, somebody that's faithful. We decide to follow God. There's, there should be no turning back. We should, we should have our eyes fixed on him and say, you know what? The life that I'm living for the Lord Jesus Christ is the best life to live and, 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 and let the world stay behind us. And Paul said this in 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens, Galatia, Titus, and Amatia. When he mentioned Demas, Demas said Demas was a follower. Demas was a young man that Paul was training to be a pastor. But Demas got his eyes looking backwards, amen, looking on what he left and said, you know what? I'm going back to the world. Demas hath forsaken me. He could have been a pastor. He could have affected eternity. He could have helped people understand uh, all the truths and the richness of Jesus Christ. But he turned back and went after the world, and he lost. When we see that name Demas in the Bible, it's not a good, it's not a good sign. Because he, he didn't stay steady in his following of the Lord God. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The Bible says in James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What are we after here? Uh, Jesus said, no man having looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He's not fit to follow me. Back in old times, if you were plowing, you could not take your eyes off on the row you were plowing because it would go crooked. I'm saying that we cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ if we're constantly looking over our shoulder saying, hey, what's the world got going on? What's the world doing behind me? We Okay. This world is going to offer up uh, any number of, of enticements, any number of distractions, any number of avenues to, 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 to get us to, to stop following the Lord God, and it's going to make it look good. But I'll tell you what, once you go after the world, you're going to find you're chasing your tail, and there's nothing good in this world. Nothing is as good as the world makes it seem. There needs to be a steadiness in following here. One admonition that the Bible gives us, is, it's a very short sentence. It's found in Luke 17, 32. Remember Lot's wife. She escaped, didn't she? She got out with Lot and her two daughters, right? As God was bringing the destruction, the fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. She got out, amen? She wasn't in there when the, when the fire fell, when the, when the fire and brimstone came down. They, they had made their way out of there. But what happened is they're making their way out of there. She didn't pay attention to the command she was given. She looked back. What happened to her? She became a pillar of salt. She is used as an admonition today. Hey, remember Lot's wife, don't look back. Hey, if you've gotten out of the world and gotten out of the world's system and gotten out of the world's uh, 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 rut, amen, don't, 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 don't desire to go back there. Because well, the devil will always make it look a lot better than it was. I remember the good old, the good old days weren't so good, amen? You mean those good old days of hangovers and lost money and, and worthless living and scars and frustration and hurts? You remember that, those good old days? I think, the, I think the good nowadays are more, more worth proclaiming and, 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 and enjoying, amen. I'm glad I get to serve God now. It's not without its bumps and bruises, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather earn the bumps and bruises following the Lord Jesus Christ than, than through my own stupidity and own sinfulness. Well, people think you're foolish for following the Lord God. Well, let them think I'm foolish, amen. I'd rather be a fool for Christ than a fool for anybody else. Amen. Following him. There needs to be a steadiness there. I need to be in my place. There are folks today that are on my heart. They're on my heart this morning. I was praying for them, and th they could be here today. But they let things, they've let things 
behind or even present stop them from being steady. Steadiness, key to following. Sacredness, we regard following Jesus Christ as something special that we set apart and, and invest in and cherish. Following is that sacrifice. Being whatever God wants, I'm willing to give him. If it's my time, he can have my time. If it's my talents, I will use those for him. If it's my treasure, then guess what? I'll gladly turn it over to him. If it's my life, then, Lord, I gladly give it. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He understood this. There's nothing in this world worth, worth dying for, but Jesus Christ is certainly worth living for and dying for. I wasn't talking about salvation this morning. I'm talking about following. Are you willing to pay the price to follow? Am I? I was a pastor. That's easy for you. It, it, it cost me something to follow him. It cost me a good job. It cost me a lot of security financially. It cost me some friends along the way. It cost me a house. Cost an awful lot. You saw you did it? Not in the slightest. Now, you ask me that tomorrow morning, I might be willing to sign my resignation papers, but, but when, it, when it comes down to it, where, where, where am I going to go? I'm just like the disciples. You know, Jesus Christ in John chapter 6, when a bunch of people walked away because they couldn't take his doctrine, will you also go away? And Peter said to him, where, where, where could we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. There's nowhere I could go but down from here. And everybody ought to feel like that as a follower of Jesus Christ. There's nowhere I can go but down from here. When you follow Jesus Christ, you're willing to make those sacrifices, willing to regard it as sacred, and willing to stay steady. Guess what? You're on the best track, on the best path. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not, going to say, I'm not saying it's going to be uh, uh, absent of any tears or any troubles or any trials. But I'll tell you what, when you're on that path, when you're following him, it is worth it today. It will be worth it tomorrow, and it will be worth it in all eternity. And time will tell. The followers of Jesus Christ are the happiest ones. They don't, they're, not, they're, not, they're not immune from troubles, but they're the happiest one in those troubles. The, 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 the ones that are following, guess what? They have the tears too. But those tears are being captured in God's bottle and written down in his book. And there's a confidence there. I just want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad I believe on him. That saved my soul. Amen. That washed away my sins. Thank God for the day I came to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. But thank God for the day I decided to follow him and regard my life as just an instrument in his hands. The sacrifices aren't too great. The sacredness is wonderful. I get to, I get to see things clearly. God is, God is more important than anything. And that steadiness is something that I desire. I wanna, I, when my life is over, I want to say like the Apostle Paul, I've finished my course. I've finished my course. I hope that you feel the same way. I hope that you want to be a follower as well. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your love for us, and thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ for putting things out there so transparently that we could see it and examine ourselves in light of it. I pray that some folks today would be challenged. Lord, maybe that our believers, maybe that are unsure, uh, that today they'd take that step and say, you know what, I want to be a follower. Oh, it's going to cost me something. I understand that, but I'm willing to pay the price. And Lord, I'm going to have to put uh, following Jesus Christ at the top of my priority list, and so... Uh, that sacredness, I'm going to have to deal with that as well because there's other things in my life that would be rivaling for, for my attention and my affection and my, my energies. And Lord, I'm going to have to be steady. I'm going to have to just put my hand to the plow. I'm going to have to keep my eyes focused on Christ regardless of what people are doing around me, what, regardless of what people are doing uh, in my life and out of my life. Lord, I'm just going to keep my eyes focused on you and stay steady behind the plow, just stay steady following. I pray that, Lord, some of us would just have that courage say, Lord, I want to follow. I want to be a follower. Take these challenges to heart and meet them, Lord, with the help of God and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit that we could be good followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I talked a good bit about that at the beginning. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, it's not a matter of being a Baptist or being a member of this church. It's a matter of you trusting Jesus Christ, realizing that only Christ can save you. There's nothing you can do save coming to him and saying, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and that God raised you from the dead and I believe that your death was sufficient to pay for my sins. My friend, if you've never taken that step, if you've never come to that conclusion, never come to that realization, maybe God's speaking your heart that way today. And if you're a man, one of our men would love to show you from the Bible how you can put your faith in Christ. If you're a lady, one of our ladies would like to do the same. But if you're here this morning, you're not sure about your salvation, please let's get that cared for. And secondly, I'd like to say this. If you are a child of God, you can look back to a time and a place when you did put your faith and trust in Christ. He is your Savior, and you know heaven is your home. Let me ask this question, are you following? Are the sacrifices too daunting? Is the sacredness too demanding? Is, is, is the steadiness uh, just too discouraging? 
I can't, I don't know if I can follow the whole way to the end. Uh, my friend, we can't live any more than in the moment where you're in right now. We should determine to be steady in every moment, then God can take care of the, the future for us. What will it be with you today? Will you just, are you content just to be a believer and to serve God sporadically, or would you like to take a step up and be a follower? Holy Spirit, please speak to our hearts today. Convict us, challenge us, comfort us, Lord, whatever we need today. But Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would consider well being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ.